Zoom recording. Okay. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The title of our chapter is Natural Selection and Variation, right? Variation and Natural Selection. So, when you start any chapter, make sure you know the meaning of the title. Make sure you understand what you are studying about. What is variation? Sundas, come closer. Get your chair there. Okay, so what do you understand, Sundas, by variation? Let, let's start with variation first. What do you understand by variation? Variation is... Uh, yeah, a little the, louder. Variation is the difference between... Um, like if we're talking about uh, variation in uh, people, so the differences between different people. Okay, so yes, differences between the organisms belonging to the same species. Okay, and that's the proper definition. So again, I will repeat, variation is the differences amongst organisms belonging to the same species. Why is it important to mention belonging to the same species is because See, there are differences between organisms. Like if you compare a human with an insect, for example, there are tons of differences. I mean, they're absolutely different species. So if you just say differences between organisms, that's it. Then remember the differences between the human and the insects, will, those differences will not be called variations. They are different because they belong to different species. That's why they are different. By variation, the word variation is uh, the differences between or the differences amongst the humans. Like they are all humans. They have two eyes. They have a nose. They have one mouth. And you know, of the general features, we all have the same. We all have two eyes, alhamdulillah, and all of that. But we still differ from each other in our features, in our complexions, in our hair color, in our heights, body weight, body shape. There are so many differences, but we are still humans. We all are humans. So variation are those differences between the, not, I, I shouldn't be using the word between, but amongst the organisms of the same species. For example, if we talk about horses, now, all of them are horses. They will have four legs and general shape would be the same, but they, will, they might differ in their color, in the uh, 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 color of their hair, in their height, in their weight, right? You get my point? So variation are those differences amongst the organisms belonging to the same species. By the way, what is a species? What is the definition of a species? What is a species? Sundas? Yeah, it's okay if you don't know the exact definition. It's fine. Uh, species is from like, uh, Louder. Species are like organisms that have a common ancestor. Common ancestor. Well, um, that's not the definition, but I'm trying to think, is that acceptable? See, species are those organisms which can, which are similar and they can inbreed. They can inbreed. What do you, what do you understand by inbreeding? Yes, Ajwa, you have any idea what inbreeding means? Zorse, beta, zorse. They can uh, produce fertile offspring. Yes, good job. Yes. So uh, inbreeding means that they can um, reproduce successfully. Right. So if, 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 if we come across any term that you don't know the meaning of, please let me know. Okay. So again, variation is the differences amongst organisms belonging to the same species. And you know what is what a species is. Species are organisms, similar organisms, similar meaning, having the same characteristic features, and they can inbreed. Okay, then, so let's talk about variation first, okay? In today's class, I will only talk about variation. So natural selection will be in the next class. So let's move on. Uh, before we go into 
the types of variation, I also want you to be familiar with the terms phenotype and genotype. Do you know anything uh, already about these two terms, phenotypes and genotypes? Uh, louder. Yes, yes. Yeah, the genetic makeup of yeah. an individual. Physical features only. Yes. Other than genetic. Yes, anybody? Ajwa, Hala, Myra. Uh, what do you understand by genotype and phenotype? The genetic makeup and the genes. Yes, that is genotype, right? Okay, what about phenotype? The physical appearance. The physical appearance. Okay, if I say that somebody is uh, short tempered is that a phenotype that's not a physical feature somebody is short tempered and it runs in the family for example being short tempered runs in the family for i'm just giving you an example so is that a physical feature so what will you say any observable feature it can be physical and it can be a personality trait it can be a behavioral trait okay so don't use the word physical because uh, it also includes non-physical aspects there are non-physical aspects to it such as uh, behavioral traits personality traits okay so phenotype is any observable characteristic which is due to the genotype or it might be due to the interaction of the genes with the environment for example um a pine tree pine trees are usually very tall this example is given in your book so I, I took this example from your book so pine trees are usually very tall right so they have genes for tall height but if uh we keep pruning the roots and if we do not allow uh enough space to its roots then it grows uh to a very short height they have given this picture in your book right so this is an example of how the genes interact with the environment to give you a phenotype so it had the genes for the tall height i mean it had the genotype but it did not have the environmental support because we kept pruning pruning meaning trimming the roots so we kept pruning the roots and we did not allow so it this was grown in a small pot they have given a closer look here it was given it was grown in a small pot so there was not enough space available to the roots and therefore it did not catch a lot of height so this is this is an example of how genotype interacts with the environment to give you a phenotype right so uh, so we can so you will say phenotype are observable characteristics which is due to the genotypes interaction with the environment and genotype, on the other hand, are what genes a person has, what alleles are present for that gene. Now, I want to know if you know what gene, what is gene? What is, what is the definition for gene? Yes, Hala? Is a part of a DNA which codes for a specific protein? Very good, yes. It is a unit of heredity. Whenever we are talking about inheritance, that's the unit. It is the length of DNA. It is the smallest length of DNA which passes from the parent to the offspring and it codes for one whole protein. Are you getting me? For, um, right, so let me. So if, for example, this is the DNA, I mean the smallest part that will be passed on to the next to the next generation without uh, getting any smaller. So that's called the unit of heredity. This is the smallest thing that will pass from the parent to the 
how do we do this? The smallest unit that will pass from the parent to the offspring, that's called the gene. And one gene will code for one type of protein. One gene will code for one type of protein. I mean, I mean, if the protein is made up of only one amino acid, can be one amino acid, but basically this is. Like, for example, you will have one gene for eye color, then you might have another gene for um, height, another gene for hair color, and so on and so forth. Yes? Miss, your voice is very distant. Because of, I, I am very close to the laptop, I don't, okay. So, uh, okay, now tell me, so what I, what was the next question that I was, okay. What's an allele? What is an allele? Who knows? Sundus? Allele. Yes, okay, Ajwa. They are the alternate forms of a gene. Very good, yes. They're alternate forms of gene. Like, now we just discussed gene, right? How do you move this? Here, oh, okay. So uh, uh, we just discussed gene, right? So if, for example, um, for example, we are talking about the gene of eye color for example. So there, there might be two forms of gene that we are dealing with, for example, in, you know, it will depend upon what population you're talking about and what population do the parents belong to. So that will decide how many alleles of eye color do you have. So for example, let's say we are talking about um, a blue and black. Okay. So if I so we, I, we, we usually use symbols like this. What does this mean? This means that this person has to, and, and for every gene, we have at least two alleles. Why? Because one is from the mother, the other is from the father. Because organisms have two parents, therefore they have two alleles of the same gene. Do you understand? So allele means, like for example, this big B is for black, and there's a small b is for blue. So these are two alleles for the same gene, which is eye color. So eye color is the gene and these are alleles. So these are the two forms of same gene. So remember gene meaning what feature, what protein is this part of DNA coding for? Okay, so the gene is eye color and so we have these two alleles so this is what we mean by allele alternative forms of the same gene alternative forms of the same gene now there might be different alleles like uh, hazel gray green this and that but um yeah it will it will depend upon what alleles are coming from the parents okay that's that's the thing so Another thing, another question before I start with this chapter, because you should be familiar. I, I'm, I know that you might have done these terms in um, hereditary chapter, right? But I didn't do that chapter with you guys. So that's why I just wanna recap these terms uh, with you. Another thing, when we say uh, DNA coding for a protein, what do I mean by coding? When we say DNA codes, for protein, what does the word code mean? Yes, on this? Any idea? Huh. Okay. So, okay, tell me, how many DNA bases do we have? How many different types of DNA bases do we have? Come closer. Zor say, Volo beta, you are whispering four. in your ears. Yes, thank you. Yes, there are four bases. 
Please name them. A, C, G, and T. They, A, G, C, and T are the names. They are symbols, right? Yes. Do you know what they stand for? No. Okay, Sundus, you tell me. Come on. No. Okay, at least I have the key. Okay. Adina. It's a Guani. Guani. Very good. Somebody said adenosine. Now, adenosine is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. By the way, that is also a nucleic acid, but I, this is adenine. Huh? This is adenine, guanine. Huh? Adenine, guanine. Okay. Cytosine. Thank you. Thymine. Okay. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. How do they pair up? A and T pair with uh, A pair with T and G uh, pair with C. Yeah, how I remembered is at Green Cabin. This is how I used to remember. There are many other mnemonics, whatever works for you. At Green Cabin. Why? Why do they pair only this way? Any ideas? Why do they pair this way only? Huh? No idea. Yes, Hala? Yes, Hala? No, Miss, I don't. Okay, who is this? Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, uh, the reason why they pair this way, part, the part, part of the reason is because one of them is double ring. Okay, one of them is double ring, pentagon, hexagon, I don't remember exactly. One, the other is single ring. Okay, and the space between the double helix of the DNA is only enough for three rings. This is space. This is space between the two rings is only enough for three rings. So one of them is single ring and the other is double ring. So together they make three rings. Do you understand? I don't know which one is which. I mean, which one is double and which one is single. But what I know is that the space between them is only can only accommodate three rings. And, and so, for example, if A combines or pairs up with C, both of them are double rings, or uh, you might have combinations with single rings, you know, single and single. So single and single, if, if thymine uh, pairs up with guanine, then single, single, that would be two rings together. So that will be too small for this space. And so they won't be able to bond with each other. And if adenine pairs with cytosine, then you have double, double, four rings, that's too much, so that it doesn't work. So the combination can only have three rings, okay? So that is part of the reason why they pair up this way. Okay, coding means that each amino acid that goes to make the protein, we all know, right, that protein is a macromolecule. It is made up of many amino acids attached to each other, right? So each amino acid has a code. It has a code. Um, so like um, the, the sequence of these bases will decide the sequence of the amino acid in the protein. Are you getting me? So uh, how many different types of amino acids do we have in our body? I think I, I don't exactly remember, but I think 21 to 22, and each one of them have their own codes. Okay, so this is what we mean by coding. So you can think of this as the letters. So, you know, just like in alpha, in English uh, language, we have how many le letters do we have? 27, I think. Yes, but look at the number, look at the variety of words we have. So it is the rearrangement of the same letters in different ways that gives us different words. And then the different arrangement of words that gives us different sentences and then different arrangement of sentences that gives us 
different uh, types of writings, essays, poetry, and this and that. So this that this is an example. So similarly, rearrangement of these bases, like for example, let me see G G C T A G C. For example, this sequence would give me one particular uh, C G G. So, uh, so this will be for one type of amino acid, amino acid one, amino acid two, amino acid three. This will code for amino acid three and so amino acid four. Okay, they have their names. I'm not going into the details, but then these amino acids are arranged in the sequence and then they bond with each other. And what we have is a polypeptide, which then turns into a protein, which is a protein. So this is how we get protein. And this is how DNA codes for the protein. Okay, so this is what we mean when we say DNA is coding for that protein. Did you understand Sundus, somehow? So we will do this in greater detail in, in other chapters, but I wanted you to know at least, you know, basics before we discuss this variation. Okay. So now let's get back to variation. So once we know what variation is, let's discuss the types of variation. So we have uh, two types of variation, continuous and discontinuous. Now continuous uh, variation will be depicted by a graph like this. Now, as the word suggests, continuous variation, that means we are talking about features that are varying continuously. So like we have two extremes. We have two extremes. Let's talk about skin color. Yeah, that's easier to explain and easier, easier to understand. Let's talk about skin color. Now, there are two extremes. Let's take two extremes. One is absolutely white. Yeah, yeah, absolutely white. And the other extreme is absolutely black. Now, in between black and white, we have different shades. We have so many different shades. We cannot even count them. There are so many shades. Okay, so uh, do you think this is a continuous variation or a discontinuous variation? It's loudly, beta, loudly. Continuous or discontinuous? Discontinuous? Yes, this is continuous variation because you have all sorts of um, range. I mean, the color can fall anywhere between these two extremes. The color can fall anywhere between these two extremes. So basically, uh, a, a continuous variation is, is that, ch that change in characteristic that can lie anywhere between two extremes and uh, there are no defined, there are no, um, like you have all sorts of in-betweens. Do you understand? So like, for example, height. Okay, let's take, but you can have the shortest possible height and the tallest possible height, whatever those values are. I don't know what those values are, but the height can vary anywhere between those two extremes. So, and the height can fall anywhere. I mean, if for example, somebody is 167 centimeters, the other person is 168, there might be many people with 167.1, 167.2, 167.3, five, five. So, I mean, the range, the person can lie anywhere between these two extremes. So this is also an example of continuous variation. So if in a question they give you a feature and they ask you to classify uh, whether it is continuous or discontinuous, you should see, can I have a range? Can I have a continuous range of this feature in a population? Now, let me... Uh, give you an example of discontinuous variation. What is discontinuous variation? Louder, Sundas? Yes, blood group. Yes. So yeah, blood group is a very uh, common, typical, easy to understand example. 
so the graph look the, so we usually use bar graphs for discontinuous va variation we usually use bar graphs not a line graph like this was a line graph this is called a line graph in which you use a line so it's curved y axis is the number of people at each height the number of people and on the x axis you have that feature that you are studying it can be skin color height body weight whatever okay now discontinuous again on the y axis we will have number of people and on the x axis you have for example blood group so we have blood group a blood group b blood group ab and then blood group o do we have any other blood groups in between a and b or in between a b and b or do we have any blood group other than these four no we don't have these are the only so you cannot have anybody so for example if the uh, graph for a certain population is this way for example will you have anybody here in this part of the graph no right will you have anybody here no will you have anybody here no okay so the population has to fall in one of these one of these four bars okay so as long as that person is in, in that population that person has to fall in one of these four categories no there are no exceptions louder okay, okay. so and this is an example of discontinuous va va variation is there any other example of discontinuous variation coming to your mind any other example gender very good very good yes so you have males and you have females sometimes there are abnormalities but uh we are ignoring them or you can have another third category for them as well okay then another example any other example ear lobes yes ear lobes uh some are uh, free and others are attached you don't have in between so you can have attached ear lobe and free so these will be your and again on the y axis you have number of people so you will have two bar graphs this way and you will not have any in betweens you will not have any in betweens so when whenever you want to decide if a feature is continuous or discontinuous see can you have in betweens if you can have in betweens that means it is continuous because continuous is a range from one extreme to another if you think that no people or organisms are falling into discrete groups and they, there can be no in betweens then that is a discontinuous variation okay another example is horns on these this this was a good example horns in the cattle so there are no in betweens either the cattle has the horn or it doesn't have one of these two there are no in between the sorry rolling the tongue yes rolling the tongue yes that's another so either the population can roll the tongue so you can roll the tongue or cannot roll the tongue like that and then you will have two bar graphs okay so according to the so what will be the definition of discontinuous variation the characteristics features um fall into discrete groups with no in-betweens okay few clearly defined features into which organisms fit with no in-betweens okay you might have this definition you might have definitions at the back of the book and if for any reason you cannot learn a definition don't worry just make sure that you understand it and that you can express your um, understanding in appropriate words if you can do that i think your definition should be acceptable okay one thing that i wanted to discuss is that can you can you uh, observe something in this graph this graph is the same as in your book what does this graph tell you 
what can you conclude from this graph? So this, what, what is, can you read this graph? So what, what does it tell you? Yes. Right. Right. So that means that most of the population lies in between these two, in this category. Most of the population have a height which is neither too small nor too tall. So if you have very tall people, that is they, that, that's a very small population, right? And if there are people who are too short, that is also a very small population. So generally, normally, uh, medium features are supported by the environment. The environment or adaptation makes sure that we don't have extremes, but we have medium features. Yes. So we will talk about that later. Okay. Now, these continuous features that we just discussed, they usually are a result of many genes plus the environment. Why do we have continuous features? This big range of features that we have, it, has, it is due to many genes because there are so many alleles possible for skin color, for example. There are so many alleles in this whole world. If we look at different races, how many colors do you see? All sorts of colors. Look at the Chinese color tone, then European color tone, African color tone, Indian color tone, Malaysian color tone, South American color tone. We have so many alleles in this world for skin color. Plus it has to do with the environment. So in um, sunny countries, countries, equatorial countries that have a lot of sun, they have darker skin tones compared to colder countries that have paler uh, skin, uh, skin tones. So it has to most of the continuous features, for example, height, talk about height, same thing. We have so many alleles, so many alleles or so many alleles, sorry, not genes, so many alleles for height, okay? So it will depend upon the environment plus the allele. So was there enough vitamin D available so that the genes can do their job of uh, synthesizing all that protein that the organism needs to get that height? Okay, so alleles plus the environment. So most of the continuous features are a result of alleles plus the environment working together. Whereas compare that with the discontinuous variation. Do you think environment is playing a role here? Does it matter where you live? Does it matter what environment you are for the blood group that you have? Does it have to do with your environment? Like, can we say that, you know, in America, people are only blood group B or in Saudi Arabia, they're only AB. Is, is that true? No, they're all different. Like they yeah. uh, they have mixtures of in every country. Right, right. So that means this only has this is only dependent upon the allele. It does not depend upon the environment. So environment does not play a role in discontinuous features, and there are only very few alleles in this whole world. These are the only four. As in fact, not four alleles are these one and two. We have only two alleles. This is absence of any of the alleles. This means no, neither A nor B. This is what it means, neither A nor B. So we have only two alleles for blood group, two alleles overall in this whole world, two alleles for blood group, that's it. So most of the discontinuous variations are um, the due to few alleles and no environmental contribution. Same goes for rolling of tongue. Either you can or you cannot. So there are only two alleles. I don't know how that works. Uh, I, I don't know if it's recessive or 
but but you got my point right few values and no environmental contribution towards the discontinuous variation okay then um yes your book talks about the causes of genetic variation what are the causes why do we have genetic variation so you guys must have read the book right so give me one cause Give me a few causes. Mutations. Yes, very good. What was that? Can you say it again? Mutation. Mutations, right. So what do we understand by mutations? Yes, Andus? Mutation. What is a mutation? A sudden very good. Sudden change in the um, sudden change in the gene, sudden change in the DNA. So what, what do we mean by change in the DNA? So remember the double helix structure? No, it's okay. So uh, mutation can be any sort of, any sort of um, a change. So there are like bases bonded with each other, right? On each of these uh, strands. So if for any reason this molecule is damaged or any of the bases have been removed or any additional bases have been added or any sort of change. It can be replacement, it can be taking away, it can be addition and it can be just simple damage. Any sort of change will be called mutation, okay? Some mutations might be without any reason random mutations due to uh, the copying of the DNA during meiosis. I did not discuss meiosis with you. I hope you know what meiosis is. What is meiosis? Real quick. The division of cells. Very uh, good. Which results in uh, genetically different uh, daughter cells very good yes yes so yes so a meiosis is um it takes place in sexual reproduction when you have male and female gametes uh fusing and so uh for example just just a quick recap if for example this is uh a female gamete and this is a male gamete and this is their genome genome meaning you know all the chromosomes that they have this is half the, the normal number. Remember, gamete cells have half the normal number. So they are haploids, okay? They will double up, meaning they will replicate. Replication just means copying of the DNA. Copying of DNA. So each strand will make its copy. So, sorry, that happened before the gametes. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, okay. So before these gam, I'm sorry, I, I got confused here. So these are gamete cells. So copying took place before these gamete cells were formed, right? And then after copying, they separated, okay? They separated. And so the gamete only got half of the double amount, okay? So each gamete will have half the number of chromosomes, okay? So if there is any mistake, or anything goes wrong, even minor, even if one base gets changed. Some mutations are harmless. Some mutations are harmless. Some are, many of them are harmful. Most of them are harmful. A few of them are harmless. And there are also useful mutations. There are also useful mutations, such as uh, most of these alleles that we have today are believed to be results of mutations. Okay, so, uh, and then, yes, and then there can be radiations. You know, that's why rays are considered harmful. So they, if the, the radiations, they can also damage these bases, ionizing radiations, especially. Ionizing meaning that those radiations have enough energy 
to knock an electron out of an atom and ionize it. That's why they are called ionizing radiation. And these radiations can also damage these bonds between bases. They can even damage the base molecule itself. And the radiation can harm even the backbone of this DNA. Okay, so, so this is one example for, this is one example of uh, variation which is caused by mutation. Now, this example of uh, some, something going wrong during meiosis, one example is Down syndrome. One such example is Down syndrome. So in Down syndrome, the 21 first, the 21st chromosome does not separate. You know, after copying, it does not separate or it fails to separate. So one gamete, in, it, this happens in females. This happens in females when the maternal age is advanced. Not all the time, but yes, it gets common as the maternal age advances above, I think, 30, above 30 or 40, something like that. Uh, so after the DNA has replicated and copied itself, uh, the 21st chromosome, so each DNA is in the form of pairs, right? And they, they are called homologous chromosomes. This you must have done in the hereditary chapter. And after doing, after copying, then they, they divide into haploid gametes, right? So the 21st chromosome fails to separate. And so as a, what happens is that one gamete gets both the, both the homologous chromosomes for the 21st chromosome. The 21st has both the homologous chromosomes, whereas the other gamete does not have 21st chromosome at all. So this one, which did not get any 21st chromosome, dies. This one survives. And when it is fertilized by the male gamete, the, the child or the zygote that is formed suffers from Down syndrome. Okay? So that's what they mentioned here. Okay, so this is an example of mutation going wrong. Uh, sorry, uh, re uh, DNA replication and uh, going wrong. Okay, let's, they have also given an example of this pony. So this pony belongs to a species that has a short height. So this is an example of a feature that is due to genotype alone without any environmental influence. So no matter how much you feed this pony, this will never grow beyond a particular height. It will stay small. Okay, let's discuss these questions. Decide whether each of these features shows continuous variation or discontinuous variation. A, blood group in humans, this is easy. Very good. Foot size in humans. Continuous. Very good. Leaf length in a species of tree. Continuous. Continuous. Very good. Presence of horns yes. in cattle. Discontinuous. Yes, very good. Then for each of the examples in A to D above, suggest whether the variation is caused by genes alone or by both genes and environment. So remember, continuous will be both genes and environment. Discontinuous genes alone. Did you understand? So this was discontinuous? Yes. This was continuous, this was continuous, and this was discontinuous. So the discontinuous ones will be genes alone. No role of the environment. And continuous, both genes and environment. Right? Is there any question so far? Please feel free to ask. Okay, so mutation we discussed. What are the what are the other causes for variation? What other possible causes of variation? Adaptations to environment. No. Yes. No, I'm asking the reasons for variations. So one was mutation. What do you think others are? Yes, Ajwa? Radiation. 
yeah radiation that is in mutation radiations cause mutation so we already discussed mutation i am saying any other cause other than mutation yes myra gametes and reproduction you mean to say meiosis do you mean to say meiosis yes yes meiosis is another cause of variation how how come how is meiosis responsible for vari for uh, variation? See, if you have mitosis, you have done mitosis, right? Have you done asexual reproduction? Yes. yes. Yeah, my yeah, mitosis is asexual. What we mean by asexual is that no male or female gametes are involved. It's just simple, plain replication. That's it. That's it. It's just simple. There, there was one cell. Uh, it formed, it, uh, the DNA copied itself. Okay, there were two copies. And then it simply divided into two daughter cells. So each daughter cell now has exact identical copy of the DNA. And so they're going to be exactly identical. That's how bacteria... That, that's how all the prokaryotes divide. This is called asexual mitosis, no male-female gametes. So can you see the daughter cells are exactly identical? They are identical. Why? Because no addition of gene from anywhere, whatever genes were already present, they just copied and they separated. That's all. So no additional gene addition or removal or replacement. Nothing happened here. So this sort of reproduction can never give you uh, variation. This cannot give you va variation. So all those vegetables and plants and fruits that undergo asexual reproduction, they are all identical. The offsprings are exactly like their parents and their offsprings are also exactly like them. So there is no variation. So you will see that those organisms that undergo sexual reproduction, they have more variation. <coughs> and so that variation is good for them. Why? Because, see, by this mixing of genes, the mixing of genes can, uh, uh, the organisms can get rid of the, um, some harmful genes in the process. You know, the gametes, that have the harmful genes might not take part in fertilization. So the offsprings get rid of some harmful genes that the parent might have. Okay, so that, that's a, so that sometimes is a useful thing. Okay, and, and sometimes what happens is that one parent might have a defective allele, but the other parent has a healthy allele. So the healthy allele compensates so the offspring does not get the, I mean, the, the offspring does not have the complete effects of the unhealthy allele because it has the healthy allele from the healthier parent. And so that's a good thing for the, for the child, for the offspring. So therefore meiosis, meiosis is responsible for variation in organisms that undergo sexual reproduction. Okay. And so there are so many different combinations. There are so many different combinations of uh, uh, different alleles. For example, if you have, um, for example, if you have a, a black eye parent, okay, black eye parent, but somebody in his ancestors had colored maybe blue eyes, so his allele or his genotype would be this. So he has one allele for blue eyes. For example, this is blue and this is black. So though his eyes are black, but his genotype has one for blue, okay? And so the other one, um, if for example, uh, is completely black, then now the offsprings will be something like this, right? What am I doing? So you get my point, right? That uh, there are different combinations of alleles. So the, these different combinations are responsible for the variation in a population. 
So you have BB, you have BB. Okay, so this was not a good example. Okay, this is not a good example. I cannot think of a good example right now, but uh, I think you get my point that there are different combinations of alleles. And so uh, uh, meiosis is one reason of variation in a population. Okay, what might be other causes of variation? Fertilization itself is another uh, cause of va variation. Why? Because fertilization is that point where the actual mixing of the allele takes place, right? You have a female gamete, and then you have this male gamete. When they will, when they undergo fertilization, their genetic content gets mixed up. So, if, for example, after fusion, this is the zygote. This is the zygote. Now, now the genes from the female gamete entered and the male gamete entered. So this is a source of addition of new genes. So, so this gives mixing up. Do you understand mixing up? And there are so many possible combinations that it is nearly impossible to have two organ or to have two organisms which are identical. You cannot have two organisms which are identical except for the twins which are exceptions, which are not that common in a, pop, in a population, even, the, even in the twins, not all the twins are identical. Even the twins sometimes look different. Yes, so even the twins are not exactly, exactly identical. So why is this? Because of so many variations, so many different combinations. We have so many genes. It is almost impossible for two organisms to be exactly the same until and unless they are absolutely identical um, absolutely identical twins you know those twins which are exactly identical do you know why they are exactly identical i'll tell you what happens is that when a female gamete fuses with a male gamete the daughter cell the zygote that forms okay the zygote that forms that undergoes mitosis. It undergoes mitosis. You know what happens in mitosis? Simple copying and separation, right? So this is, so this is what happens in identical twins. So after the fusion of the gametes, the daughter cell, charger, charger the daughter cell undergoes mitosis. And so now this develops into one individual and this into another individual and they're exactly identical. That's why, because of the mitosis that took place soon after fertilization. This is not normal. This doesn't take place. It shouldn't have taken place, but for some reason it does. Okay, so then what are they discussing next? Adaptive features. What do you understand by adaptive features? Features that allow an organism to uh, live in an environment. Very good. Yes, exactly. Very good. Yes, exactly. So features that enable an organism or help it to survive in an environment those are adaptive features. Um, for example, for example, this is an example given in your book that those fish that live in shallow water, they might be very flat and uh, their bodies have the same color as the, as the bed, as the bed of the, the ocean or whatever. You know, again, again, it's not getting charged. So, so it's easier for them to be camouflaged, okay? So that protects them against the predators. And so therefore they can live longer. They can live longer. Living longer means that they can reach their reproductive uh, stage. They can turn into adults. Uh, and so they can breed. And so they can have 
children offsprings with which will inherit their genes so they will be successful in passing on their genes to their next generation they will be successful in passing on their genes to their offsprings compare this to those organisms which do not have these adaptive features and so they can be easily uh, pointed out by their predators can be e easily eaten and so they can never reach adulthood or even if they do reach adulthood they never i mean most of them die before they get a chance to breed and so they fail to pass on their genes to their offsprings before they can pass on they die themselves so they cannot pass on the genes to their offsprings to the next generation and so their genes die out because their genes are no longer in the population because they never pass them on are you understanding so there are adaptive features for the predators and then there are adaptive features for uh, the prey. So the prey has to avoid the predator and the predator has to have features that will help it get to the prey. Are you understanding me? For example, the predatory fish have a streamlined bodies. Now this streamlined body enables the fish to swim faster and therefore reach its prey faster sharper teeth will enable it to kill the prey faster okay so that's uh, helping the predatory fish whereas this camouflaging capability is helping the prey fish are you getting me so this is how these features help each one of them and uh, so yeah this is what they're trying to okay let's talk about Okay, so they have introduced this term fitness. What does fitness mean? The organism that fits the best. Survival of the fittest. What does fit mean? This term fitness. Biologists often use the word fitness to describe how well adapted an organism is. So fitness in this chapter, survival of the fittest means how well adapted that organism is to its environment. So it will get a greater chance of surviving to adulthood and reproducing. Okay, then they are discussing the adaptations of xerophytes. Xerophytes are those plants which uh, are adapted to survive in places where the water is little. Okay, such as cacti and succulent plants what are succulent plants plants that can store water within their stems their leaves their different parts uh, so that they can conserve water and use little water for a longer period of time so most of the desert plants are succulent plants okay now uh, so let's do this question the photograph shows a small mammal called a tarsier. Tarsiers feed on insects, which they hunt at night. So they have to hunt at night. How is the tarsier adapted for survival in its environment? Yeah, so when you look at the picture, look at what features is standing out to you. Which, stand, which, of, uh, which feature of this tarsier is standing out to you? Standing out for you? the Giant. big eyes yes so that means these pupils can dilate a lot and this dilation will help it to see at night when the light is less okay and so it, that will enable it to um, get more insects and be healthier and be fitter right okay okay then these are the features of zero fights i think you guys have done this before right have you guys done this? How these desert plants are adapted to live in deserts? Yes, miss. So can anybody give me a summary? Closing stomata real quick. I, I, I want to finish the zero fights. Real quick. So what happens? These stomata, the primary function of these stomata is the uh, entry and leaving of gases. Right, those gases include oxygen, carbon dioxide, 
and water vapors, basically, these three ga gases. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, and steam for respiration and photosynthesis, right? Uh, so if the stomata close, these gases cannot enter or escape. And if they open, they can. So these are like the doors. And these stomata are found on the undersurface of the leaves, never on the top. Why not on the top? Louder, louder. Right, to prevent dehydration. To prevent dehydration, they are found on the under, under surface of the leaves because then otherwise the light would be falling directly on them and that may, might lead to dehydration, rapid evaporation of water before the cells can use the water for um, uh, their own survival. Okay, so, uh, but in extremely hot conditions, extremely hot conditions such as those found in the desert, uh, in, for the survival, the stomata has to close. And how they close is that in extreme hot, extremely hot temperatures, the water evaporates. And so the, this is vacuum. The white sac that you can see inside, these are vacuums of these plant cells. They lose water because the water is being evaporated, uh, evaporated, right? The water is being lost. And as the water is being lost and the vacuole becomes flaccid. When it is flaccid, due to the unequal thickness of the cell wall, you can see that uh, the cell wall which is uh, surrounding the opening or the hole is thicker compared to the, the, outer, the outer cell wall. The outer cell wall is thinner, thin cell wall. So you know that the thin cell wall can stretch more than the thicker one. This has more elasticity. The thin cell wall has more elasticity. So when the outer cell wall stretches more than the inner one, what happens is that it gets into this curved shape. And curved shape means opening of the stomata. Whereas in when it is turgid, when there's enough water in the vacuoles, um, both the cell walls are almost the same length and so there is no curved shape. And so that leads to the closing of the stomata because both the cells are lying just opposite to each other, lying flat opposite to each other, right? So this is how, this is a, a protective mechanism uh, by, which is found in zero fights. Now, what happens is that the water vapors are not allowed to leave to prevent dehydration. But at the same time, Oxygen will also not will be will not be allowed to enter. But then you know survival is more important. We can do without the oxygen for some while, but dehydration will be more damaging. Okay, another way xerophytes uh, prevent dehydration is by having these stomata in pits. Having stomata in pits. Having in pits. For example, this is the opening stomata and this is a pit this is a i'm i'm showing you the close up of a leaf surface so they have pits on the leaf surface for example this is the stomata at the bottom of the pit now if the water if the water vapors evaporate they will get collected in this pit before they can leave out before they can escape out they will get collected and this collection might cause them to fall again to re-enter Remember the rate of evaporation increases as you blow, as you remove the vapors. And, and vice versa is true, that if you don't blow, if you collect the vapors, the rate of evaporation will be slow. So the idea here is to conserve water to decrease the rate of evaporation. You get me? So this is another adaptation of zero fights, okay? Okay, um, then they have hairy leaves. Hair gives them additional uh, a layer that can trap the moisture, okay? Another way of uh, conserving water. Then uh, the fact that the stomata is on the underside of the, the, of the leaves also helps them conserve wa water because if they were at the top, the water will be, uh, would, would have evaporated real fast. Cutting down on the surface area, they have needle-shaped spiky leaves. This is to 
uh, minimize the surface area which is available to sunlight for evaporation and this would mean less evaporation but remember this will also mean less photosynthesis because remember it was the leaves that were photosynthesizing there is some chlorophyll in the stem but it's not as much as the leaves would have photosynthesized okay okay then having deeper spread out roots the deeper and the more area the roots are covering that means that would mean greater chance of absorbing water or absorbing more water molecules all right that's uh i think that's easier to understand okay then there are hydrophytes. Now, hydrophytes are just the opposite of xerophytes. They are found in wetland. They are found in water. So they will have features exactly opposite to the ones that we just discussed. They will have wide surface area of leaves. Okay. And uh, a lot of stomata, right? And those stomata will be usually open, right? Until and unless okay so and the cuticle is thin right they don't need a lot of waxy cuticle oh yes i didn't discuss the waxy cuticle what's the purpose of waxy cuticle to yes. prevent what yes because wax is waterproof why is it waterproof because remember wax is non-polar water is polar so because of non-polar polar molecules do not dissolve in non-polar and so it's like a barrier let's do this question real quick and after that i will finish the class copy and complete the following sentences using words from the list okay okay variation can be defined as differences between individuals of the same species very good sometimes the differences are clear cut and each individual fits into one a smaller number of defined categories this is called dash variation discontinuous yes clear cut smaller number of defined categories discontinuous this kind of variation is caused by the organisms dash genes. genes very good in other cases the differences have no definite categories this is called dash variation continuous, continuous. very good cell division by mitosis does not usually produce variation unless there is a change in the dna called mutation mutation because mutation is will be the direct damage to the dna otherwise mitosis does not cause any variation most mutations are harmful because they make an organism less well dashed to its environment adapted 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 very good okay let's see distinguish between each of these pairs of terms genetic variation and environmental variation genetic variation is the difference louder uh, it's the differences in the genes of organisms. Uh, no, genetic variation will be a variation due to mutations, yeah. meiosis, okay, oh, fertilization. Yeah. Environmental variation would be like uh, due, due to the conditions. Of the yeah, environmental variation will be due to the environment. And the environment. Like, for example, um, yeah, excess of sunlight may cause damage skin or um, uh, good nutrition will lead to taller height. Okay. Malnutrition. Yes, malnutrition might lead to other different features. Okay, continuous variation and discontinuous variation. So you can just write down their definitions. Continuous variations are variations in the features of uh, organisms of a species. Uh, which can lie anywhere between the two extremes, okay, such as a skin tone, such as height, body weight. Now, discontinuous va variation of variations in the features of organisms of the same species, which are due to few genes and the features fall in uh, one of the few discrete groups with no in-betweens, right? I think you guys can can write this on your own okay so we have uh, discussed variation and in the next class which will be after ramadan i will um discuss selection okay